Let's turn to God's word, to Joshua chapter 3. And we're going to be thinking a little bit in the time that we have about this passage. Now, I think that all of us have at some point found ourselves in a situation that is very new. And you might be facing something that you've never faced before. And it might be sometimes that you might be thinking, well, how am I going to get through? Now, it might be a first day at school. It might be a first day at work. It may be the moment that you have to sit down for some test or exam. Uh, you might look at that paper. You might think, well, how am I going to answer this? It, it might be a bit more than that. It, it might be that there are times that you're at home and you're on your own and you feel it and you think, well, how am I going to get through? It might even be when you wake up in the morning and often the day can be a challenge for you. When I was growing up, I um, probably, well, the age of Jonathan's uh, children and growing up, um, I was often uh, at home, I wasn't very sporty, and uh, I was also, I think, uh, well, a bit overweight. Um, I would just like to sit at home and, and read, and I, I remember um, when I began school, um, secondary school, 11 years old, and I remember that Monday afternoon, and it was sports, and I remember it was cold. I had my T-shirt and shorts on. We're all in white. And I was with a number of other 11-year-old boys. And we had to do a one-mile run. I'd never done anything like that in my life. And I don't think I would mind it too much now. But at that time, it was, for me, something new. It was really a bit scary. And every Monday afternoon, it was the same. We had to do this. And I always wondered, how am I going to finish this? How am I going to face that every week? Now, we all have our fears. They can be big and they can be small. And some of us can feel that sometimes about life itself. And we wonder how we're going to get through. The story of the Israelites is all about how to get through. And it's very relevant, this chapter, Joshua 3. They had to go somewhere that they had never been before. And from a human point of view, they had every reason to be afraid. You see, in front of them was the wide, dangerous river Jordan. And on the other side of that river was the unknown cruel pagan people of Canaan who they were going to have to fight and this story in Joshua 3 tells us that whatever dreadful thing that you're going to have to face the Lord Jesus is with you the Lord Jesus is with you to the end and even though you've not gone this way before Jesus has and this passage tells us at these three truths that you must hold on to Jesus before you Jesus with you and Jesus behind you Jesus before you Jesus with you and Jesus behind you now first Jesus before you the Israelites were about to go into the promised land this is the moment the Lord had promised them this land. Canaan is the land. And before them is this Jordan River. And beyond it is this fierce pagan people. And for the Israelites, this is the unknown. This is really scary. And three days, they are sitting there. But then the orders are given to the people. And we can read them in verses 3 to 4. This is the order given, the command. As soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your God, being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. 
Yet there shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it in order that you may know the way you shall go. For you have not passed this way before. It's an order to move out, but it's not just an order. This order is full of encouragement and comfort. You see, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, their God, would go before them. They were going to go into the scary unknown, but they would know which way to go because the Ark was going before them. Now, if you were to read this chapter again, if you were, were good at counting, if you read chapter 3, if you went into chapter 4 as well, you would see that the Ark is mentioned at least 17 times. That's a lot, isn't it? And I think the Lord wants us to keep our eyes on the ark. Now, what was the ark? It was a box about a metre long, 70 centimetres wide, 70 centimetres high. It was made of special wood covered with gold. It was carried on golden poles. Within that ark were the Ten Commandments, God's law for the people. And on the outside was a lid on the top, it was called the mercy seat, and there were two cherubim with their outstretched wings facing each other. Now the ark, it represented God's rule and God's presence. Where the ark was, there was God. So the ark, the sign of God's presence among his people, goes before his people. And the Lord is reminding us that he's leading his people into Canaan. And that's the point. The Lord always goes before his people. We don't know often the way we're to go, but the Lord does. And whatever you may be going through or having to face, he is going before you in your individual life, as a church, Jesus is going before you. Notice what they're also ordered to do, but keep a distance, we're told, um, between you and it, about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it. Now, that's about 1,000 yards from uh, the ark. It's over half a mile away. Now, why do they have to keep that distance? Well, the ark was holy. It represented God. It reminded them of who God was and who they were. But I think there's also something else here. It also gave everybody a better view. That distance allowed all the people to see where the ark went and what the Lord would do. Because can you imagine if they were all crowded round, not everybody would see. And it's crucial that Israel recognise what is about to happen. Unless they see all the facts, then they're not going to understand fully the meaning of what happens. Now, when I was a student many, many years ago, um, I went to the Opera North in Leeds and it was the first opera I went to see and the first opera was in English and I thought that was a good idea because I'd understand what was going on but the problem was I spent all the time straining my ears to understand what the opera performers were actually singing that I ended up not really seeing or hearing or appreciating or enjoying the show. The next time I went... The opera was in Italian. And you might think, well, that's even worse. Well, actually, it wasn't, because I first read up on the story. I prepared myself. I took a step back, and I saw the bigger picture. And it's only when I knew the story, what it was all about, I was prepared to view and hear and take in the event and appreciate it. And so as I watched and I listened, I was able to see the show unfold in all its, its beauty and glory. 
And we could say that this is something of what's happening here in Joshua 3. God's people needed to be properly prepared for God's, if I can say it in the right way, God's show. If they were going to appreciate it, if they were going to be encouraged in their faith, they needed to step back and see the big picture. And when they did that, they saw two things. First, they saw even more graphically the difficulty they faced. But secondly, they saw the path that God made through the difficulty. First, they saw the difficulty. Now, this is the Jordan River. And we're told some very important facts in verse 15. And it says that, now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest. You see, at certain times, the Jordan River isn't very wide or deep, but it's harvest time. And it's the harvesting of grain, such as wheat and barley. And apparently in the late months of spring, the banks are overflowing. Now, one writer tells us that if this was similar to what was in the 19th century, the river would have been from 90 to 100 feet wide. It was a depth of at least three feet to as much as 12 feet. Now I'm six feet, so that's twice me. The current was also very strong because the drop in elevation would have been quite big. And so this river would have been a raging torrent. And it was possibly a mile wide then. And that's important. That's what the people see. That's the difficulty. But there's also a second thing that they see. What the Lord will do. And as we read on into verse, from verse 15 into verse 16, we're told that um, as soon as the, the, the priests um, stepped into the ark, sorry, into the river, onto the, the land, the water came back and let me just read this in verse 15 as soon as those bearing the ark had come as far as the jordan and the feet of the priests bearing the ark were dipped in the brink of the water now the jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest the waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away at adam the city that is beside zarathon it goes on. Now, there's a lot of detail there, but it's important. Now, from the ta town of Adam to Jericho, it's apparently it's 16 miles. So can you, can you think? The water goes back. It heaps up 16 miles. 16 miles. I think that's half the distance from Llangollen to uh, Deeside. And in the other direction, it's five miles. And the point is this. It does, that doesn't just happen, does it? It's not something that's natural. It's the Lord. And the people are seeing the greatness of the Lord and what the Lord can do in difficult circumstances. And the Lord wants them to see how great he is and what he can do. And the Lord has done something great in our lives. The Lord went before us to Calvary, to the cross. See, what's the greatest difficulty that we could ever face? And isn't it, how can I ever reach God? How can I ever be at peace with God? There's no way that any of us can reach God. Our sins are like a, a raging river between us and God. And crossing the Jordan is, excuse the mixing of metaphors, but it's a drop in the ocean to crossing the great divide that separates us from God. And it's only God that can bridge that divide. He became like one of us. He was born in a manger. He lived our life, but without sin. That's the incarnation. And then he went to the cross. 
He bore our sins and the judgment that we deserved. That's the atonement. And then he went before us to the grave. He rose from that grave, conquering death. That's the resurrection. That's the miracle of the incarnation, the atonement, and the resurrection. And what do we do? All we can do is but look and live. Trust and be saved. The Lord Jesus has gone before us. And, and this is the thing. If he's done that, he will continue to go before us in whatever we are going through, even right now. Nothing can be compared to the cross. And whatever you are going through, the difficulties you might be facing, remember what the Lord has done for you at the cross. And he'll be with you, he'll go before you. But you must trust and follow him. Lord, I would clasp thy hand in mine, nor ever murmur or repine. Content whatever lot I see, since it is thou that leadest me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Jesus before you. Secondly, Jesus with you. The Israelites are told to follow and so they obey and they step out. And verse 16 continues into verse 17 that the people crossed over opposite to Jericho whilst the priests, we're told, bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And notice that the Ark stands in the midst of the danger whilst the people cross. The Lord is in the midst of the danger amongst his people. He's amongst them. He's amongst them in power. See, before they'd gone into the water, Joshua had said to the people, as we read in verse 9 and 10, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. Here is how you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites and the Jebusites. He's saying, look, look at what the Lord will do here in the Jordan and he will be with you. They're gonna face untold dangers, but they're gonna know that the Lord is with them. I, I, can we really imagine what they experienced as that water went back in those directions? But they would have seen the Lord in that way. Now, John Calvin, I think John Calvin amongst many people today, sadly, is not uh, somebody that they appreciate or like to hear of. They think of a, a mean and hard man who knew little of the cares of the world, but they don't really know this man. John Calvin's only child, a boy, died shortly after he was born. His loving wife, Idolette, died after just nine years of marriage and throughout his life he had terrible migraines for some time he could hardly speak and he spat blood he suffered from hemorrhoids gout in later years kidney stones in february 1564 he writes to physicians about his struggle to pass a kidney stone sorry to be graphic but he said that lacerated his urinary canal he was often ill he was a refugee who fled from his home, country France. He never returned. He was misunderstood, often. He was criticized, he was put down, he was attacked. Yet, as uh, the theologian Gary Williams writes, Calvin knew that no matter what their trials, Christians never lose, are never defeated, and are never poor. We're always wealthy conquerors because we have the Lord Jesus Christ. And in his final weeks of life, John Calvin wrote, If adversity befalls you and death surrounds you on every side, 
still hope in him. Still hope in the Lord Jesus. Haven't we known his power? He's the one who came down to this world as a baby in Bethlehem. The one who is very God amongst us. And in that manger, that, ch that child in Bethlehem, wasn't the greatest power ever seen? And the Son of God becoming like one of us and then bearing our sin and bearing the judgment. An eternity of judgment for us. Dale Ralph Davis puts it this way, the crossing of the Jordan and the death and resurrection of Christ are explosions of God's power that are meant to colour the whole horizon of the believer's life in order to assure us that God who so mightily handles great emergencies is surely adequate for the smaller crises and anxieties that beset us. Fear not, I am with thee, or be not dismayed, for I am thy God and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand, upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. When through the deep waters I call you to go, the rivers of sorrow shall not overflow. For I will be with you, your troubles to bless, and sanctify to you the deepest distress. Jesus before you, Jesus with you, and Jesus behind you. I don't know if you notice what we're told in that verse 17, that last verse of chapter 3. Now the priest bearing the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel was passing over on dry ground until all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. The priests waited with the ark. Not until all the people crossed did the ark come across. And only then, as we're told, and we, that, and we're also told that if you were to read in chapter 4, in verse 18, only then the waters returned. It's only when everyone crossed that the priests with the ark set their feet then on dry ground. See, God ensured that every single one of his people was safe. And the fact that the waters only returned afterwards shows that God was in this. And isn't it true that that is how it is with all of God's children? If you are a child of God, then the Lord isn't just only before you, he's with you, but he's behind you. He will always ensure that you will reach the end. You will reach the promised land, the new heavens and the new earth. Didn't the Lord Jesus stay behind on the cross? He stayed until the work was finished. Only when he knew that, only when he knew that all that was needed was done, did he cry out on the cross, it is finished. He's bleeding, he's pleading, he's crying, he's dying, as he fights to go on breathing, his mind sees each soul he will redeem. You know, one Monday afternoon as I was dragging my young chubby legs around that one mile run and wondering whether I would make it, the teacher, the PE teacher as he was known then, who at the beginning had barked out orders, came running up behind me and then he came running alongside me. And it wasn't to shout anything at me. No, instead he began to, to talk to me. He began to say words of encouragement. I remember I think it was just me and one other boy. We were the last. It was to keep me going. And he never stopped being with me until I got to the end. 
That never happened before, but for some reason he saw I needed some encouragement. He never left me until I reached the finishing line. The Lord Jesus is with us to the end of the line. And whatever we're going through, he's before us, he's with us, and he's behind us. And he'll never leave you or forsake you, but he's going to keep you to the end. So you must not fear, but just trust and obey and just keep, keep, keep going on. Even down to old age, all my people shall prove my sovereign, eternal, unchangeable love. And then when grey hairs shall their temples adorn, like lambs they shall still in my bosom be born. The soul that on Jesus has leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavour to shake, I'll never, no never, no never forsake. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love, your compassion, your grace. We see it in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're reminded again that you are the God who will always be with us and never forsake us. Help us to trust in you. Amen.